as in Sri Lanka, our focus is on the education sector. With all the technological advances across the world, are we at a groundbreaking revolution in education? A transformation that will empower the students of Sri Lanka and pave the way for limitless possibilities. With a rapidly growing population and a thirst for knowledge, the need to digitize the education sector has never been more critical and with it brings potential for growth and development. It will bridge the gaps that have hindered equal access to quality education for all students, regardless of their location or socio-economic background. The pandemic gave us a glimpse of the shortcomings in our systems. Education took a boost from all areas in ensuring that we harness the power of technology to address the shortcomings. One of the success stories of the COVID pandemic in Sri Lanka. Can we now continue to replicate this in a bigger way and ensure that it's the foundation of our nation's future? But while doing that, have we addressed the hidden dangers or at least be aware of them so that the path we are trying to steer for our kids remains intact and not hijacked? For opinions, analysis and insight, joining me today is the Minister of Education, Susil Premajantha, State Minister of Technology, Kanaka Hera, CEO of DP Education, Kaushi Amarasingha, and CEO of Tresenk Australia, economist Imran Forka. This is another Verona special presentation, Digitizing Sri Lanka, Education and the Future. Now, reporting live from Studio 24, here's Mahesh Jani. Welcome to our series, uh, Digitizing Sri Lanka, where we continue to discuss about the issues pertaining to the digital aspect of our country and trying to get a better understanding exactly how we can thrive. Uh, as we all know, our economic crisis has given us an opportunity, in my uh, opinion, uh, where we can actually look into the areas that didn't work well for us and also uh, make sure that we rectify them and proceed uh, ahead with full force so that we continue to benefit from these areas of interest. Um, in order to talk about education per se and digitizing education, uh, today I've invited uh, the Minister of Education, Cecil Premajantha. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. I appreciate it. Um, State Minister of Technology, Kanaka Hera. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for being here. Uh, and also CEO of D P Education, Kaushi Amrasinghe. <coughs> Welcome to the program. Uh, and also CEO of uh, Tristan Australia, um, Imran Furkan. Welcome, Imran. Good to see you all. Uh, let me start off with um, the Minister, um, uh, Minister Susil uh, Premjant. Yesterday, I think in Parliament, your budget was uh, uh, taken taken up uh, mm -hmm. and it was discussed. What what kind of portions was put into this digital aspect of it? Because uh, I think COVID kind of gave us a, a big boost, saying that this is a need, not not something, not a, a thing that we could be you know thinking about, but we have to do it. So, what was the budget uh, allocation was like towards this aspect? Yeah, of course, uh, it's very important uh, topics uh, we are discussing today. And thank you for thank you, Derana, for inviting me today. I have been here several times. But uh, digitizing Sri Lanka, the national program, is already designed and it's in place at the moment. I think State Minister will explain further. But in the field of education, of course, I took over this ministry this time one and a half years ago. When I was the Minister of Education 2005 to 10 during a uh, trouble period, that is uh, because the of the war. But uh, after I attending a conference in London, so I managed to get the first uh, 10 smart boards at that time, somewhere around 2009, about 15 years ago. And at the same time, we started computer resource centers all over the places in the country, uh, 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 zonal wise. That is to train teachers, then of course to develop the program. But unfortunately, after I left, of course, uh, uh, only thousand uh, laboratories introduced uh, after 2010. Uh, those ten thousand uh, laboratories, they have about 60,000 uh, computers. 
so other than that uh, i think i don't know whether any any meaningful steps taken towards improving uh, uh, it uh, education in the country but after i took over i appointed a committee comprising university academics especially kalambu university morotua and the vocation training sector and then nie that is to upgrade the syllabus from grade 6 to 13 uh, and at the same time we have to uh, 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 make provisions for infrastructure facilities now for this year budget 2023 Uh, one billion allocated through TRC to give connection for thousand schools uh, outside of Colombo. Yes, all over the places, uh, thousand schools. Uh, that is the fiber optic, right? Now, uh, so far they have given six hundred connections. That is up uh, uh, in the. So we have to uh, spend more money. for the infrastructure facilities of the school within the school so up to the gate they have given the connection right and at the same time we are getting uh, 20 million us dollars grant from our friendly country by about march april the feasibility has already been started a grant not a loan no no it's a grant it's a grant so then that is to facilitate 3000 schools we have about 2900 schools where we have gc advanced level uh, either old streams or common sense streams all together nearly 3000 so with the education reforms now we are starting by january the restructure of the administrative system so without the uh, proper administrative system in place uh, you can't think about other Uh, reforms. Uh, so, it, uh, actually, for when you talk about the administrative and the infrastructure, it, it actually falls into uh, your category as uh, state minister uh, with regard to what what the. No, let me finish it within a few few minutes. So very soon we are going to. We have already done mapping and all that. I had discussions with the members of parliament, uh, uh, provincial and zonal education authorities, all nine provinces, uh, uh, a few months ago. Now. Uh, what we are going to do is we have 10,126 public schools in different categories, right? One to five, then one to eleven, one to thirteen, like that. So then, what we are going to do is to cluster all these into 1,220 clusters. Okay. So in a cluster, you find six to ten schools. In among those schools, you find one or two uh, lead schools with facilities. Uh, from grade six, that is up to GC A levels. So, so you find thousand two hundred twenty, thousand two hundred twenty, yes, twenty clusters, and the school boards three hundred thirty-five to supervise all these things, and then for the administration administrative purpose, hundred twenty zones. So we have to increase another twenty. So we have earmarked thousand one thousand two hundred twenty lead schools, covering. All 1,220 clusters. When you say that, uh, Minister, are you saying that just the connectivity is given because it connectivity, connectivity is, not is uh, given to uh, 600 so far out of the 1,220. So you have to they have to continue and complete that. So the other other facilities like computers. Uh, yeah, wait, wait, wait. We are getting all these because I, as I told you, the feasibility will be completed by mid January, right? Then by end of march april we are getting uh, you know smart boards other devices and all that to start the program uh, my target is by mid next year to start the phase 1 to complete 1500 schools covering all 1220 clusters it means from north east west central everywhere so that is how we selected these schools and apart from that there's another project there is virtual classrooms so it is cabinet approval has been given even for previous uh, project also cabinet approval has been given uh, and the 20 million dollars also allocated by that particular government uh, once this feasibility is completed so we are getting funds and the virtual classrooms also uh, we are getting a grant right we finalized last week the cabinet memorandum Uh, that party also from our neighboring countries so uh, they are going ahead with their project with that grant 
uh, we, have, we can start the project by, by next year, come around mid year. Uh, Minister, uh, let me ask the State Minister, the government came out very recently something called DG Econ uh, plan which is exactly the policy that the government wants to implement. So in a scenario like that, what exactly is the target and how much of that is going to education sector? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, let me start with briefly explaining the digitalization in Sri Lanka. So to accelerate the digitalization in Sri Lanka, His Excellency the President initiated uh, DigiCon 2030 because he is the uh, Cabinet Minister of uh, Technology. So uh, we initiated DigiCon 2030 and uh, uh, the main objective of DigiCon is to have a digital economic policy framework in Sri Lanka. So we didn't have it so far. So. Uh, this uh, strategy was, we came up with it, uh, we are waiting for the cabinet approval. Uh, this was done in collaboration with uh, the support of the World Bank and the, and the industry as well. So uh, we are waiting for this approval and at the same time we have started implementing some of the projects. right? And uh, there are six thematic pillars in this uh, strategic document and out of which uh, three are directly connected to education. If you take uh, connectivity, infrastructure and access, it's connected to uh, education. And then skill development, literacy and job is also connected to education. And also cyber security is also very important right now. See, So uh, three pillars are also connected to education. And as the minister mentioned, uh, we have uh, in line with the 2023 budget speech, uh, we have uh, started uh, connecting 1,000 schools. The project started this year and uh, as he mentioned, we have finished six, uh, 600 schools so far. Our responsibility is to provide connectivity and uh, the education ministry will provide all the equipment. Uh, minister, uh, before I go to the next guest, uh, because uh, we have to say goodbye to the minister, uh, he has to run to the parliament uh, very soon. But uh, let me ask uh, from our education minister, uh, what exactly is the uh, idea at the end of the day? Where, w What kind of a vision do we have for the education sector? Are we going to be fully digitized? Are, is our students are going to be in power with world class uh, standards? Or what exactly is the vision there? Yeah, of course now, last year when I attended the uh, UNESCO General Assembly in Paris, of course, it is stated that all the member countries of the UNESCO, about 194 countries, uh, now see countries like developed countries, of course, they all have facilities at the moment in place. Yeah. Not now, of course, last Long time. 10, 20 years ago. We are lagging behind compared to some other countries, especially countries like Vietnam and other countries, of course, we are lagging behind. So, we are in the fourth industrial revolution, right? Within, uh, we are we are missing fourth industrial revolution also, right? So therefore, uh, we have to run fast. So therefore, uh, I had all the discussions with University, Columbia University, more to uh, where they have uh, faculties and all that, and the, uh, our uh, uh, NIE and all that. So then we had some discussions with Microsoft. So I met their vice president in New York uh, last year. So with all these inputs, of course, then we decided to introduce a policy. So that policy is within the framework of national policy. Right? So there are no conflict. They, they are responsible for national policy framework. We are responsible for education, digitalization of education. So then, as, uh, 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 as in Paris, all the ministers agree. So uh, by 2030, so we have to digitalize entire education system. Right? So this is the. If I may just ask a small question, what does it look like then when so you digitalize? Look like means now see in other countries, of course, even from kindergarten, uh, they use uh, laptops and then other devices and all that, and then the uh, smart. Uh, they don't have blackboards now in the green boards. Uh, yeah. About 10, 15 years ago, they started with smart. Uh, smart uh, boards. Smart boards. Yeah. Actually, I was given 10 smart boards uh, free of charges, uh, 2009. I gave it to our uh, uh, National Colleges of Education, Ratnapura. I converted that particular college into a uh, fully pledged uh, IT, right? So, they are, of course, every year the intake is somewhere around 350, 400. 
so at the moment there are about uh, uh, 700 uh, uh, in service uh, pre service teachers are being trained that is not enough at the moment mm -hmm. so with the introduction of uh, 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 university for education separate university within the next couple of months so we are going to dedicate one particular faculty for IT uh, plus AI and all that with the, all these you know emerging technologies so uh, so country like Sri Lanka and we are now with the economic setback uh, yeah. uh, we are experiencing last year and continuing so far right so we are short of funds so that is the reality so that is why we are expecting some grants from our uh, uh, neighboring countries or the the our friendly countries so those are how much of, like you can say if you when you say you're short of grants how much of this is being discussed with the private sector? How much of opportunities does yeah, the private, private sector? Yeah, private sector, of course, we are working always for last 10, 15 years, the FITIs, they are working very closely with us, the industry, right? So therefore, any private sector can help us, no problem. So there are no question about that. But only, but the, the responsibility of the government mm -hmm. is to see the facilities are provided to all the corners of the country irrespective of you know now see Colombia you find leading schools in cities you find leading schools but in remote areas yeah. you don't have and we have nearly 240,000 teachers so we have to train them also right so to do that we have developed 104 centers uh, all over the places so we have to increase another 15 uh, to make it 120 so each and every zone we have a computer resource center where they have uh, smart boards and the other devices and the trainers so then we can train our teachers so it's a huge task yeah. so we have to so what we have done is with the available funds we have phased it out and by mid next year we are going to start the uh, phase one uh, that is digitizing 1220 uh, lead schools and then the phase two then from grade 6 to 13 then we can uh, come down to from grade one to five like that. Minister, it's a very ambitious program. Uh, do you think that we have the capacity to uh, get to all those areas? Because we've seen a lot of policies and strategies that have kept on coming with regard to this digital aspect of it. But all here we are, you just said, we are at the fourth revolution and we, we are missing it. Do you yeah, think yeah, we yeah. are capable? So, so I am not blame, blaming anybody. But the thing is, that is the reality. Right, because we are, I'm, we are attending international conferences, regional conferences, right? So, so we we experience what's happening in the other other part of the world. So, but however, uh, as the government with all these challenges, now one and a half years ago we were in uh, uh, fuel queues for four or five days, right? No gas, no electricity now. Electricity yeah. is an essential uh, uh, commodity. Uh, as far as uh, digitalization is concerned but at least now you are getting 24 hours electricity it's very expensive uh, compared to you know other countries in the region but however so then those are challenges so as you said it's a challenge but i'm i am sure that uh, by mid next year we will be able to uh, provide uh, or at least digitize uh, the phase one uh, covering 1,220 schools. Absolutely. Uh, let's take a short commercial break um, because we have to let uh, the Minister of Education leave. Um, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for taking the time, at least coming for a short period of time. Let's actually keep this uh, discussion going on. Uh, I'm in conversation with the Minister of uh, Education, uh, Susil Premijan, the State Minister of Technology, Kanaka Hera, the CEO of DB Education, Kaushi Amarsingh, and CEO of Trisenka Australia, Imran uh, Furkan. We will get to them shortly, but before that, let's take a short commercial break. You're watching our special presentation, Digital. Digitizing Sri Lanka. We'll be right back.
Welcome back everyone to our special presentation, Digitizing Sri Lanka. We are focusing on the education sector uh, today and uh, here with us uh, we actually had to, um, to let go of the uh, Minister of Education, Susan Premachantha. I mean we really appreciate him even coming uh, at a time when the parliament is uh, actively uh, going on right now. Uh, he is the leader of the house so he has to be there um, when, when parliament proceedings are uh, occurring and he still came here and um, uh, shared his uh, ideas about what the Education Ministry is doing, so we really appreciate that. Right now, here with me is the State Minister of um, Digital um, Technology, uh, Kanaka Herath, and also CEO of DP Education, Kaushi Amrsingh, and CEO of Trisank Australia, Imran Furkan. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's start with um, Kaushi. Uh, you're coming from the private sector. Uh, yeah. What exactly uh, is the reason for you to get into this uh, field of education? Because Yola, uh, I understand digital aspect is a big pr prominent uh, uh, part of your entire uh, strategy. So why did you actually pitch into that? What was the reason? Yeah, definitely. So firstly, when we take DP education, it is a not-for-profit. It's a foundation and actually there's no attachment to business. This is done by one of the biggest philanthropists in the country, Mr. Dominga Pereira. So this is his private initiative to develop the economy. That also came into being because we studied around 71 countries. Uh, we had a learning curve in uh, starting from 2016 till 2019 because only on 2019 we initiated DP Education to go public. But during those three years, we studied with our uh, Mr. Pereira's direction, 71 countries and how their GDP per capita income increased. There, I, I can give you one example. As we all know, Singapore, uh, in 1997, they came with their uh, thinking school, uh, learning nation concept. From 1997 up until today, their GDP per capita income has only increased because one of the main reasons for that is how much they have spent on education development within the country. So in 2010, from their total government expenditure, 20% was allocated just for education development, starting from preschool education, which is a critical fact, which unfortunately we don't see that happening no. in Sri Lanka. And uh, from the last numbers that I have, if we look at the Sri Lankan government and the expenditure we put on education development, that is somewhere around 3%. And that is also not on early education development, which I think we need to improve going further. So that was one reason. And then, because current our GDP per capita income is 3,470, which we want to increase to 12,000 GDP per capita income in order to become a developed nation. So that is a long-term vision Mr. Daminga Pereira has through DP education for the country. That is one reason. And secondly, we also analyze data from 2005. Within an 18 year span, uh, considering the annual uh, birth count. So in Sri Lanka, uh, on an average, the annual birth income, uh, the number is at 360,000 births per year. When you analyze it for the past 18 years, and actually do the calculation as to how much skilled, like how many skilled people are coming out, we only have 30%. So the rest 70% is considered unskilled. Mm -hmm. So That's that a is huge a huge number. vacuum. So that vacuum also we saw. And then uh, there is a personal aspect also for DP education from Mr. Pereira's family. Uh, they wanted to give equitable access to quality education for everybody in the country. If their children also have in the, the highest quality education in the world where they can compete globally, they had a question why can't rest of the Sri Lankans also get that opportunity. And also I want to highlight everything that we do. We have over 21 brands uh, and then all of those things. I'll, I'll get, get into are, those uh, yeah, uh, offered, areas, uh, yeah. but before that, I, I want to ask uh, uh, from the minister. Minister, now uh, she was uh, mentioning the fact that you know, uh, in order to become a developed nation, the per capita has to increase, and that means uh, the infrastructure per se has to, in, when it comes to this field, because the entire world is moving towards the digital aspect of everything. Uh, from from the time we get uh, get up up until the time that we go to sleep, the entire process is now 
digitized to a very high, uh, high extent. Is Sri Lanka ready to meet that uh, in terms of uh, you know our digital infrastructure? Do we have a capacity to reach that level, or are we still lagging like 10-15 years behind? No, of course, uh, as we mentioned, right? If you talk about digitalization, it should be a holistic approach, right? The government can't uh, have the only responsibility. It should be it should come from the industry as well, mm -hmm. from the private sector and the academia as well. So if you talking about the infrastructure, what we are trying to do is we have uh, several projects. One is the school fiberization project, as I mentioned, and the other one is Gamata Sannivedana project, uh, which uh, we trying to uh, get the connectivity uh, throughout the country. So that is one thing, that's for 4G. And we are also looking at 5G as well, and we have started several pilot projects. But uh, the industry is not ready yet, so we are waiting for their Why approval. do you say that? Uh, it depends, you know, the investment is higher than 4G, so you have to invest on it and the return. return uh, so they are looking at the return as well. So right now we are looking at 4G and we are trying to take it to the grassroots level, to the, every corner of the island. Uh, in terms of uh, during the COVID time, we had to bank on the digital aspect of our life that was the time that we actually had to move on to that particular uh, uh, thing heavily uh, from from banking to uh, you know ordering groceries to everything so in a in a situation like that does a i mean one of the things that the uh, minister of education was saying is the fact that we don't have the funds so how can we approach in a novel way to get this because if the private sector is looking at it and saying yeah, okay return on investment is low so you know we can't be investing that much how are we gonna you know no, uh, that's for 5g i was talking about 5g but uh, when you look at 4g uh, we we have started this uh, gamata sanvedana project we have taken it to the district level and case by case we are tr uh, trying to invest on it the 50 percent of the investment is uh, handled by trc so they are investing 50 percent and the teleco companies are investing 50 percent so that's why we we are trying to expedite the project and by 2025 uh, we are trying to uh, get 4g uh, throughout the country uh, um, imran uh, what do you think in terms of the economic impact of this if we get this right where can we hit give an example a couple of examples and i, I profoundly disagree with the fact that there should be too much of state intervention in this. I'll get to that first. So 10 years ago, we went to Microsoft and told them, why don't we move the shared services center, which is in Kuala Lumpur, to Colombo? They asked us a simple question. Can you give us 4,000 accountants overnight? And we couldn't, obviously, because we could give them 4,000, but it will disrupt the rest of the economy, right? So and at that time, the whole system of creating an accountant was very, you know, uh, learning system was different. Today, the international accounting body, and I hope our local body will follow soon, uh, have the system where the entire education as an accountant can happen in their learning platform, within their you know uh, system, without going for a single class. Exams are also done, you qualify, right? So today, somebody said, can we do this? We'll say, give us two years, we can get you that 4,000. And imagine the kind of high paid job that would be, right? And, and, and the kind of impact that will have the economy. Then the ITBPM industry keeps saying um, we need uh, to get to 5 billion, right? We're about 1.8 now, I'd say. We've been struggling around 1 point <laughs> for about a few years now, right? To do that, they need to go from about 84,000 people in the industry to 200,000 people. Now, one of the challenges of that is that the university system and others have, have constraints in how to, you know, put out these gadgets. But with, with what DP education is doing, for example, with their coding school and so on, so they're trying to give not just to cater to that amount of people, that is a gap, but much more than that. I think Kaushik yeah. can tell us the numbers. Yes. Um, and, and, and at that point, what happens is then you go to bigger companies and say, oh, now we can start a, a huge center here. We can give 5,000 coders in one go. Can't, you can't quantify that in terms of how much that is to this country because we've tried that and we've gone to big IT companies in the world and said relocate to Sri Lanka. The problem is, can you give us, you know, 500,000 programmers in one go? And we simply cannot because we don't have that. Minister, we don't have the resources uh, when, it come, when big companies want to come into this country and uh, look, look at this as a destination for IT services per se. We don't have that, right, at the moment? Of course. 
But right now, uh, to bridge the gap, we have to look into short term and long term uh, uh, goals. So, uh, if you look at the uh, IT uh, BPM uh, industry, the job requirement is around 20,000 per annum. And we produce only uh, 10,000, uh, includes uh, graduates and diploma holders and also school leavers. So, what we are trying to do is, we are trying to bridge this gap uh, by uh, having short term goals as well. So, 750 million was allocated this year from the budget to have a training program for non-IT. 750 IT, million or billion? 750 million for uh, non-IT graduates, a uh, special program for non-IT graduates. So what we are trying to do is, we are trying to uh, converse the program uh, into say uh, non-IT graduates, they will be uh, through hybrid mode, uh, they'll be having training and then uh, two months training uh, on the job training for two months. So that is a short term uh, uh, goal what we are trying to achieve. Uh, Kaushi, yeah. we were talking about numbers uh, prior to yes. the program starting and you were talking about somewhere around 7 billion. Uh, uh, you know, that, that was the target that we can actually achieve in terms of digitizing the education side of things uh, and, and bringing in this. Oh, if you can explain yeah, that. Yeah, I'll elaborate. So actually, in a digital economy, one of the core pillars for that economy to boost is how much uh, that uh, whatever community is put in efforts on human capability development with digital skills. So that is exactly what we are doing with our DP Education IT Campus brand. I'll elaborate what exactly that is. Currently within an eight month span, we have opened over 100 IT satellite cam campuses around all the 25 districts. And currently we have 80,000 students who are uh, like learning, coding, and then uh, other programming languages. Also we have university collaborations with the University of Moratua, Kalani and Ruhuna for like training full stack development, data science, AI, uh, ERP with the specialization in SAP. So, so many programs which are offered free at no cost to the learners are now being taught. And this is for 80,000 students, and mind you, within eight months. Yeah, but and then she, also, uh, let, me, yeah, let me add a few yeah. more. So, uh, the main objective of our Deep Education IT campus is to produce one million young Sri Lankan coders who will, by 2028, with the five-year uh, time frame we are looking at, uh, who would get jobs in software engineering side. And currently, even as I speak here today, our first batch of students are working remotely from Situl Power and uh, plus Hatha Gala for foreign companies remotely at our institutions. So, uh, what I'm asking is this, yeah. the, if the education is provided and all those facilities are now going on in Sri Lanka, yeah. how are they going to come back into the Sri Lankan economy per se? Because most of the time what we see is they yeah. go abroad. Uh, they basically, you know, get the education here, get everything for, for free and then, you know, push comes to shove, they're out of here. So, uh, what kind of, uh, you know, assurance uh, do you all have in terms of these students that you all are, are basically teaching to code? Yeah. They're going to stick around. So, I mean, look, you, ha you need to have some incentives for people to actually stay back and then continue their occupations, right? So, what we do there currently, uh, let's take for example Situl Power Project. I'll explain on that. So the kids, they are working close by to their homes. So they are not distant from their family. Let's say they want to look after their elders or whoever the family members, there's no issue there. And then cost uh, in commuting is also reduced. So when you provide them certain incentives and then opportunities within our economy for them to perform where they will earn high income. So I think, you know, they, they have then uh, some motivation to stay back and give back to the community because only through the community they got developed. So that's how we see it. Minister, does newcomers into the technological field have any kind of better, uh, you know, aspects within Sri Lanka or it's always better to go abroad? 
No, actually, uh, as she mentioned, we appreciate what they do, especially the private sector, uh, the, their contribution, uh, we, we commend their contribution, we appreciate that. So, uh, that's what I mentioned, like the government uh, single-handedly can't uh, digitalize the uh, economy or digitalize the education sector. So, we, we appreciate the private sector. And uh, the other way around, we as a government, right now we, after the economic crisis, it's very difficult to invest on uh, education. Uh, I mean, uh, education or digitalization. Yeah. So, for that, we need the support from each and everyone. So one thing is the brain drain right now. So for that we have we have to focus on short term uh, goals for that. So that's why we have started this uh, program and also DP education and other uh, private sector education also supports this. When you all open up with the uh, private sector, do is there a good response uh, to the government when it comes to you know advancing technological aspects? Yeah, this, of course, this uh, proposal came from the industry itself. So they have identified the vacuum. They have identified that we, uh, we uh, need 10,000 or more IT graduates or uh, IT uh, students. So for that, we have to cater. And uh, by, I mean, by providing training through private sector, it supports the government. Uh, Imran, uh, before we take a, a short break, uh, what do you think, like how, how can we provide and give more opportunities to Sri Lankans uh, learning in Sri Lanka and looking for a better uh, you know, life here in Sri Lanka rather than pinpointing them to go to the west or the east or whatever the uh, uh, you know, direction. Uh, what is missing in that aspect, right? Uh, the, the intervention by the parents and the students themselves. So what needs to happen, if you look at what has happened in China and India, the huge education markets, yes, the government plays a role, they have played a role, but you also see a bigger role being played by the individual student and the individual parent who take ownership of reskilling or skilling their kids yeah. to get the kind of roles and jobs they need, right? The first aspect of it. The second aspect is once they get those skills, we need to create an entrepreneurial mindset in this country so that they can then utilize those skills to create the kind of you know, tech or other industries um, that can give them foreign currency so that they can live and work from this country, right? Remember, one of the beautiful things about digital is other than the initial uh, you know, ex uh, investment into the physical infrastructure, there is no imports as such, right? So it's, it's value addition is very, very high. We did a calculation, value addition is like 90%, right? Uh, to the IT BPM industry. So imagine, um, uh, and I, I, I disagree with the fact that they all go, Mahesh, what you said before, because I think quite a few people are staying back okay. because A, they're earning in dollars, right? And that is possible by doing that. Number two, um, they see the potential of how it can grow by them not really going um, and I again to add to what you said before so look at our number one export is actually remittances now the remittances come from low skilled workers as Kaushi was saying right what we are trying to do is actually graduate that into higher skilled workers so that means you get more remittances back because everybody who does leave the country feels something to the country right they have relatives back home parents and they will send so we want higher levels of remittances and a higher quality of workers who go and the more we create, as Kaushi was saying again, and as the minister was saying, say there's a percentage that goes, but there's a bigger percentage left in the country. Yeah. So the more we create, the better in terms of what is left back. A lot more to discuss uh, with uh, my panel, uh, State Minister of Technology, Kanaka Herat, uh, CEO of DP Education, Kaushi uh, Amar Singh, and also CEO of Trisank Australia, Imran Furkan. Let's take a short commercial break. Uh, this is our special presentation, Digitizing Sri Lanka, the education and its future. Over up. Welcome back everyone to our special presentation, Digitizing Sri Lanka. We are focusing uh, on the uh, education sector this time around. And I'm in conversation with the State Minister of Technology, Kanaka Herat, the CEO of DP Education, uh, Kaushi Amrasinghe, and also CEO of Trisank Australia, 
uh, Imran Furkan. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the issues per se. Now let's talk about um, a little bit about solutions uh, in the challenges uh, with regard to the challenges we have. Uh, Minister, one of the things that um, we, we must do and we can do is to speak to the rest of the world to look at uh, Sri Lanka as an opportunity uh, uh, place uh, that they can actually come in. They did this very well in India. They have areas dedicated for these services provided, um, you know, in that country. Uh, are we thinking in that line? Are we actually speaking to the big, big players in, in this field in order for them to look at Sri Lanka as an option? Yeah, of course. Uh, we have. Uh started actually the economic crisis affected this right so what we have introduced even uh, through DigiCon 2030 we have introduced the nomad visa uh, to come and work in Sri Lanka and also we have been having discussions with uh, uh, the big players and uh, recent, last week uh, HG met with Bill Gates as well that is one yeah. thing so we have been having investment summit was that just a, a normal meeting or is it was it targeted to get some yeah of course uh, we were planning this for a very long time and we actually wanted to invite him to digicon 2030 but uh, uh, probably next year he'll participate anyway so uh, through investment summits also we are looking into support the startups to match make the uh, entrepreneurs uh, and uh, startups as well so we are looking at the big place as well and we want uh, i mean we are open uh, we are looking for investors to come and invest in Sri Lanka. What is the challenge uh, in, in for them to come here and actually, what are they saying, okay, the problem is this, this is the reason we don't want to, you know, look at Sri Lanka as an option? No, probably because of the uh, economic crisis and they don't have confidence in investing in Sri Lanka. So that might change in the future, soon after we uh, finish our IMF uh, uh, loan restructuring program the investors might come in so we are looking forward to that and we are trying to support them by uh, especially to have a one-stop shop for the investors who come and invest especially to get the approvals uh, I think in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s when, when, when the country was being you know, economically uh, uh, looked into and, and we were looking at re revamping everything, we talked about zones. Uh, we had the industrialized zone uh, in, in certain areas and we gave facilities and everything, infrastructure at that, at that particular place. Are we looking at an IT zone per se or is that something that we want to look into just like what India has done? Yeah, actually we started this uh, IT parks. Uh, two three years ago before the economic crisis so right now uh, it has been uh, you know stopped uh, and uh, we are looking forward uh, for in I mean we are looking forward for, in uh, for investors in uh, local investors even local investors fine to start this uh, IT park uh, project again um, Sorry, can I add yeah. something there yeah. for uh, the question you raised so on the tech park matter there are also we need to have a roadmap Right, uh, just because uh, we have connections, you know, for the global companies to come in, they have other places to go. Because one thing that I see, if you look at our indices, for example, ease of doing uh, business, right? We are, I think, the 99th or the 100th, according to the last reports. So those things also needs to get improved. And those, everything, just not just that, like there's uh, other indices, for example, Digital Innovation Index. Uh, all the developed countries are ranking high there because uh, those things matter for any tech giant to come to the country and then uh, establish here, they need those supports. So th I think those things also we need to consider. And on top of that... Are you telling that it's not happening uh, in, in I mean, a productive way right now? Or? I would say no. That is because that is what the results uh, showcase us, right? So if we are at the 100 level, I mean, we should be within the top 10. That should be our target, at least uh, the first phase of it. One day we should be number one, right? That's where uh, we should head. So of course we, uh, I mean, uh, we can, uh, of course we have identified these challenges. That's what I uh, mentioned that we are trying to get the approval 
uh, in a one stop shop uh, yeah. manner so that is what we are trying to in introduce that is what we uh, are working closely with the investment promotion ministry to have this and uh, we have proposed to get uh, investment promotion on IT sector especially uh, not only on uh, IT parks or the technology parks but also for uh, the big companies to come and work here uh, remotely. Uh, Karushi, uh, before I get to Imran, yeah. uh, yes, it's good to educate the youngsters, the future yeah. generation, but we can't omit the current generation that is actually in the work field. And there are lots of challenges for them to figure out this uh, digitization aspect because they find it difficult in certain, you know, when you go into uh, government offices or, or certain areas, they find it difficult to get into the systems, yeah. continue to maintain that. And those are things that we con continuously see. Education per se means we have to address that as also. Do you all have any kind of plans uh, to, yes. to get into that as yeah, well? Yeah, definitely we do. Uh, now that is part of our digital economy action plan, right? Uh, internally, we are building action plan, which will be publicly available. Uh, we used to do this in 2019 also. That is also already out through uh, www.gamikpera.lk website. We have uh, action points per ministry. There are 23 ministries, one is the IT sector. Now that is getting revamped currently as I speak, where we consider all of these things. So there are key five pillars in a digital economy. One is human capital development, as I said before. The other is digital business, digital infrastructure, digital government, and innovation-driven entrepreneurship. Those are the key five pillars that any government would need to focus, right, or any entity. So th there also we have a plan, which will come into uh, public, um, let's give it three months. We are working on it specifically now. If we look at a country like, again, Singapore, through their SING Pass, everything is digitally connected. There's over 300 services that we, as a citizen of a country, can access through Singapore's SING Pass. From like getting your passport, to getting your driver, driving license, then even like paying fines, right? Everything is done remotely online. So there's no, actually there's no interaction between a government officer and the client, if you look at the global scenario. Minister, uh, will DG Econ address us to get to a point like that? Yeah, of course, uh, according to uh, DG Econ, uh, digital economic policy, as she mentioned, it's uh, similar to that. So we have six thematic pillars. So under that, one is uh, government digitalization, one is that. One is education, one is uh, connectivity and infrastructure development, and uh, also industry, uh, the uh, digital across sectors uh, involved in uh, industries and uh, the government sector as well, and there's uh, cyber security. So uh, right now, we, I mean, uh, we've been talking about digitalization for the past 10, 15 years, <laughs> right? But right now, what we are trying to, everybody is working in silos. Right, even the private sector, they have their own program. The uh, education ministry has a different program. The agriculture ministry has a different program. So what we are trying to do is, uh, we are trying to connect each and everyone together through DGCon 2030 or through the technology ministry. That's our new uh, objective. So that is, uh, I mean, we need everyone's support from the private sector, from the uh, universities, the academy, uh, and also the industry. So I think if we can get everyone together, we'll be able to digitalize Sri Lanka faster than what we think. Imran, do you think that's a feasible, uh, uh, you know, goal? Because you, I mean, we have done good things in silos, like what the minister says, and those are really good. But no uh, cohesive plan to look into it uh, and and you know address it. And I think in in previous discussions you were. Uh, uh, saying that the government should not be the one who's leading it, it has to be the private sector. Do you think it, it, it could be? It could be. Uh, why, why do people work in silos? Because there is no trust. 
uh, there is no trust uh, in in coming together and sort of having or inter interdependency, right? So, for example, I, I know that the government is working on this uh, digital ID uh, system uh, similar to India's, which will which will be similar to you know seeing pass and it will come together, right? Um, but I think there is a big fear, particularly because we are trying to adopt India's policy, and we had a speaker down from India who said that um, you know it has been hacked so many times. Yeah. Um, so then there is a big fear from the private sector, from the individual. Do you want to be part of this process, right? Uh, even think pass, for example, the uh, Singapore. Korean Prime Minister, uh, his health records got hacked and got released, right? And so imagine if the country that's such a high level. So I think the trust factor is what needs to be created and the coordination needs to be created. I mean, uh, before we go in for a break, uh, I, I need to, uh, you know, uh, say uh, goodbye to the minister. But um, minister, before you go, if you can touch on the cybersecurity aspect of it, especially when it comes to the education sector, uh, opening up the field to the students to the children has a big uh, you know risk carried because of you know not the nefarious activities that occur in in the cyberspace so what kind of steps is the government is hoping to take to address that because it's vital it can't, i mean if we are looking at developing the country we have to be taking the entire generation towards development not uh, you know uh, be certain addicts of certain things so is the government addressing that yeah, of course, when you talk about uh, digitalization, the flip side of it is uh, security, cyber security. So children are facing an increased uh, threat in cyber security uh, space. Now, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to bring the Cyber Security Act, right? We have worked on it. I think uh, we'll be able to table it in Parliament probably uh, next year. Okay. So we have uh, we have come up with the do? draft. The Cyber Security Act, where everyone will, not only the children, not only the women, but everyone will be uh, protected uh, through the uh, social media especially. So, uh, meanwhile, I think the Education Ministry, we have, uh, we have recommended this to the Education Ministry through uh, SLCERT to have awareness sessions, not only for students, but also for uh, parents and guardians, and also to have workshops, you know. We, it is, uh, I mean, increasingly it is a big threat to our children. Exactly. Um, well, uh, yeah, yeah, a little just, bit more. Just to add one thing before the minister because I think we have one, we have one of the best data protection acts in the world that was passed last year. It has come in com uh, commendation from uh, e even Europe because it's GDPR plus. And I think we can build on that uh, through the cyber security. I just want to add that as well. Well, uh, let's take a short commercial break. I need to thank uh, the State Minister of Technology, Kanaka Herat, for being here. He too has to go back to the parliament. Uh, my um, other two guests are the CEO of Education, uh, DP Education, uh, Kavushi Amrasinghe, and also CEO of uh, Trisanka Australia, Imran Furka. Let's take a short commercial break. This is uh, Digitizing Sri Lanka. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to our special presentation, Digitizing Sri Lanka. We're uh, focusing on the education sector and uh, we had to let uh, both the ministers uh, uh, leave because of parliamentary pro proceedings uh, which is currently ongoing. Um, um, I wanted to once again thank the State Minister of Technology, Kanaka Hera, for taking the time at least come here and share his ideas and talk, uh, talk about um, the, uh, the government side of things because that was something that was missing in this conversation that we've been having uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, with me um, remaining uh, for this discussion is uh, the uh, CEO of DP Education, Kaushi Amar Singh, and also CEO of Trisank Australia, uh, Imran Furkan. Uh, Kaushi, let, let me ask you, you, you wanted to make uh, some suggestions when we were talking about the trust factor, when yeah. Imran br uh, brought it up, uh, the trusting, uh, that's one of the reasons why everybody's working in silos. Uh, why don't you think people don't have trust in the other sectors in this industry per se? Um, okay, I think trust is also built on how much knowledge you would have on something, right? Let's say technology, the previous uh, discussion we had. So if there is a security threat, for example, then 
we study further and see what are the available solutions. The solution will also come from the technology itself. So once you build that knowledge in that particular area, trust between the two parties can grow. The trust is there if you have a fear, right? The fear can go away if you have knowledge. That's what we believe on. And then also, uh, like the point made on working on silos, I think there needs to be more collaboration and then willingness to uh, like uh, let uh, teams come in and share their ideas. And ideally there should be a platform where the industry experts, the private sector, then uh, foundations such as us can come into one place and discuss these matters. Yeah, it, it doesn't exist at the moment? Uh, no. So Not, when, uh, when you started the, this whole aspect of going to teach education, uh, yeah. you know, get them into this digital space, uh, teach them coding and all those things, w you all didn't have the other players coming in and saying, okay, this is a recorder, or you all just went by yourself? I mean, if I take DP education, I, I want to correct myself there if uh, that went out as miscommunication. What I meant uh, wo there was, we need to have a platform where the relevant parties can come together and discuss all the challenges we might have and have an area to discuss solutions. That's what I meant. But for the question you ask on DP education, we have our stakeholders. They are the government universities and then our teacher network and then uh, other consultants for curriculum development. So there is a network of uh, those people who have trust as well as collaboration and then also they bring in the global knowledge to our tables. Imran, uh, one of the things uh, um, that we really need to focus is on uh, when building trust and, and streamlining everything is the fact that action has to occur in real time and when that does not occur it's it's a big problem especially in this industry because the world is so quick fast paced I mean, I mean for a simple example when a, a cyber security attack comes in and if we are going to take uh, action in another two three days we lost the plot uh, why don't you think like the people who needs to act uh, I mean it would have been better if the minister was here but why do you think, what is the problem for them? Don't they understand the entire reality of this new world? Uh, partly yes, but partly because there's no accountability, right? And I'll give you an example. Um, the ICTA was hacked uh, three, four months ago. Yes. Um, they, uh, they, are, they had not apparently maintained uh, backups of even minister's emails, right? Yes. Um, and uh, and, and uh, well, what happened? Nothing, right? So then you go to say Australia where Optus was hacked um, and, and uh, this is the second time it happened, right? So uh, the CEO had to resign, right? So my, my point is for you to have, you have accountability. So at every stage you have targets, you have policies, you have procedures and then the final aspect of it is accountability, right? And if you are not delivering, then there has to be, when they start rolling, people start getting scared, then they start acting. So I think the process of having accountability at every level um, is where we will get to this stage. I just want to add something else from, from before our conversation, you know, um, we have been having global players producing good educational content, for example, in this country, right? For the last maybe 10 to 12 years, we've had one of the world's biggest players, Pearson, uh, produce um, a lot of the tech stuff here, right? So they have about, they had about seven to 900 people, highly paid software engineers, develop their world-class education and testing products here in Sri Lanka. Without any support from the government, they completely came on their own, set up, uh, uh, right? Then Wiley, a uh, huge American player that makes textbooks and stuff like that, they've come about two to three years, or about five years back, They've had a big center as well. Um, there's another company called Imperial Editech and so many others, right? So they have come on their own. They have set up on their own. They've grown, but they haven't scaled, right? They've got they've 700, 900 kind of staff up to about 1,000, and then they get stuck because they don't have uh, you know, resources, enough people to do it. And also the fact that um, they are, uh, see, their priorities are set at a global level, right? So they may not necessarily want to grow here. Uh, so we have to ad address those situations. But there have been good, gl big global players here. They quietly do their job for their own uh, employer and then they, you know, move on. So I think that is something needs to be addressed as well. But to get to the other point, accountability is what we need. Absolutely. Yeah, indeed. Accountability all across the board is required. That is a must. Uh, I think Sri Lanka needs to get its act on that. Uh, Kaoshi, 
this debate should the IT sector needs to come into the current curriculum in education or should the current curriculum in education completely digitize itself where do you all stand and what exactly is the pro uh, uh, the, the the strategy that or the policy that you all have taken and you all said okay this is this is the future yeah. so this is how we see it education should get digitalized right that that spectrum is vast there are many things uh, that would come into play there then at the same time IT as a subject uh, should come into the curriculum from the preschool level now when you say IT not the just the standard subject we currently have at our schools yeah. IT should be in par with the global curriculums what's, example, what's the uh, yes let me elaborate there for example we need to look at uh, um, criteria such as PISA PISA that is on reading, maths and science. Now they have a special, a special plan for 2025 with a special focus on maths, IT and science. Sri Lanka need to go there. We need to we enter those there. systems. We are not there. We have never been there, unfortunately. But I really hope we go there. That is one. And then there's another one called TIMSS, again similar to PISA. Why I'm highlighting on PISA? PISA is considered a global yardstick in developing whatever that country's education system on par with 21st century right because we need to give our children 21st century skills uh, which you know right exactly. computational thinking to creativity to problem solving and then uh, subjects such as coding programming languages should be taught at preschool level let me ask this uh, Kaushi. yeah when we are going at a very fast pace to digitize this entire industry yeah. one of the things that we might be sacrificing is our ability to think by ourselves and problem solving mechanisms and more or less we i mean the simple example i could give is those days a calculator cannot be brought into the exam hall because depending on the calculator we were told you will become dumb in maths that's you have to do the mental calculations yeah so but now it's not the case it's completely different Correct. so uh, we see that more uh, more and more these students are basically oh let's go ahead do that instead of doing it by themselves are we in the process of creating uh, people with no you know vision to think beyond what is being put forward or what exactly is it yeah I actually don't agree with that remark because when you uh, talk about 21st century skills one of the key things is uh, creativity uh, problem solving uh, and uh, computational thinking all those things are coming to the kids through subjects such as coding. If you take, uh, for example, our uh, DP coding school, that is based on these pillars. So when you go there and do the block coding, you have to think, you have to solve the problem, and then you need to find the solution, and you need to also make the end product. End product could be an app, it could be a website, likewise. So I, uh, I mean, I can, as a fact, say we are developing uh, the problem solving skills of kids through technology. Um, we're running out of time uh, very quickly Imran. Um, are we looking at a future where there are no, no physical schools anymore? No, I completely disagree. I think the, the reason for that is you you can see what happened during COVID, right? People couldn't rush, wait to rush back to, to school sure. because the, the, the getting to know other humans, yeah. interacting particular skills is very much in demand. And now if you look at even events, just look at events in, even in Sri Lanka, I, I've come back and I've noticed we're doing everything uh, virtually. Now nobody wants to have a virtual event, right? And everybody wants to have a physical event. So I think we would never replace that. Just to add to, to what Kaushi said about uh, PISA scores, right? If you go to the developed world, whether it's Singapore or Australia, I can tell you each time the country drops in that they have it every two years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, every three years. Three years. Yes. Every three years. Each time the country drops, the media goes nuts, right? They have soul searching. The minister is put in, you know, in, uh, pre in pressure in parliament, and and and, and it's, it's, they prefer not to have the test results if possible. Good. It's good. That's called accountability, yeah. right? But accountability also because you're on a global test where you can measure people there. I think we, we are the tools are there to have an exciting future. 
30 seconds, uh, Kaushi, I'll give okay. you the last word. Yeah, so on the physical school matter, I think where we should uh, go is flip classroom concept. Yes. So we should shift from the traditional way of just coming to the classroom, opening the book and going through the theory. It should be you do it at home, but you come to the classroom and, and do also, projects. Yeah, exactly. Right, you know, practically solve things. Absolutely. Uh, that is also like, you know, it's always, you know, you have to continuously think different from every uh, aspect. Well, that's all the time we have for you uh, in this program, our special presentation on digitizing Sri Lanka. Our focus today was uh, the education sector and its future. I want to thank uh, earlier on, uh, we had uh, the, both the ministers from the education ministry and also uh, from the technology ministry, um, uh, Minister Susil Premajant and also Mr. Kanaka Herak. And also thank you very much. Uh, CEO of DP Education, Kaushi Amar Singh, and also as always uh, uh, our very own uh, CEO of Trisank Australia, Imran Khan. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Well, that's all the time we have for you uh, on this program. We'll meet you again in another uh, similar episode on digitizing Sri Lanka. See you then. Bye for now.